Hello, welcome to New Harvest Christian Fellowship, Manchester, England, and thank you for subscribing to our sermon podcast. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. We pray it will be a blessing to your life, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'll give you our contact information at the end of the recording. Thank you once again. Enjoy the preaching. God with God's people. You may be seated. You know, before I get into the Word, I want to, I want to thank Pastor Tom and Grace. There, there's a, a tremendous, a tremendous uh, part of our fellowship, leadership, pastors also. You guys are blessed. And I'm going to tell you, you guys got quality ministry, quality uh, pastors here that are going to take this church somewhere. Believe me. You ain't seen nothing yet. I, I mean that. And then with the, the, the quality of leaders you have here, amen, the pastors you have here, and we go back so many years, and we're still here fighting the good fight for the kingdom of God. It just shows you that God, in His Word, and His promises are yea and amen. He's able to keep us from falling and failing. And in all our shortcomings, God keeps us in a way that He can only keep you and I. And I, I'm so thankful to be here with you here. And uh, the team are, are happy to be there. Not the first time, and it won't be their last time, I'm sure. Because we, they love coming uh, to be blessed. They, they come to be a blessing but also to be blessed. And so we come to encourage, but also we go encourage. And I think that's what it's all about. So again, thank you, Pastor Tom and Grace, for uh, your support, just for everything in our leadership here in Manchester and in the fellowship. Praise God. If you have your Bible, I'm going to read one verse real quickly in Lamentations chapter 3. And uh, what I want to do is I want to hit an area where the enemy seems to be aggressive in, because sometimes you and I can lift up our hands and praise God and worship, but in your heart, you can, sometimes you can feel like a failure. And how many of you know that's an area that you and I got to overcome? God wants you and I to be free no matter who you are. When you have Christ, you're the winner, you're the head, you're not the tail. And so I want to look at a sermon that I entitled, God's Heart Concerning Failure. You know, the importance. And Lamentations speaks at all where it says in Lamentations 3 and 22... It's because of the Lord's loving kindness that we are not consumed. How many can say amen? amen? Because His tender compassion never fails. See, God is a God that never fails. You, you and I may fail God, but He'll never fail us. But my point to you here this morning as we get into the Word of God, we need to picture how God views failure. Because some of us could be here today, maybe you failed in your life, at work, maybe even uh, in your marriage, maybe in your life, whatever it may be. But can I tell you, God does not want you to feel an ounce of failure in your heart. He came to set the captives free, and that means, that means not only the sinner, but the Christian. The Christian, the saints of God. And you see today, I'm, I'm, there's no doubt that there's maybe one or two here, maybe more so. You can lift your hands, but in your heart you feel, man, I failed here, I have failed there, I have failed. Can I tell you, you're in the right place. And as long as you're in the house of God, no matter where you came from, no matter what you've done, God wouldn't allow you in the house of God if there was no remedy for you. But there is remedy, there is hope. And thank God for that hope, because it's a living hope. Not a dead hope, but a living hope. Now... Real quickly, before I get into the heart of the message, uh, there's two types of failure. Number one, there's destructive failure, where now the enemy will begin to work. Now, destructive failure simply is this. It reveals your limitations, your weaknesses, and it highlights your shortcomings. And if not processed correctly, it can and will destroy you. Okay, now this is destructive failure. Let me give you a quick example. Judas... When he sold the Lord for 30 pieces of silver, what did he say? I have sinned, I have betrayed innocent blood. And what did he do? He went and he hung himself. That's what you call destructive failure. Now, Jesus said he came to save and die for the whole world. If Judas would have turned around and repented and said, God, forgive me. God, let your blood uh, that you're going to shed cover me. And God would have found room for forgiveness. But because the enemy was at work, the guilt was there. And that's what you call destructive failure. Number two is productive failure. Wow. You mean there can be some production and failure? Well, yeah, that's why I'm still here. Because when you fail, you learn to use them as stepping stones, not as stumbling blocks. I'm not talking about massive or ugly sin. I've been saved 40 years, and by the grace of God, I have not committed 
I never went back to any drugs, any alcohol, nothing. Zero, blank. But we still, we're still sinners. I remember one time, I shared this at our church. I was in my uh, office one time. I fasted. I prayed. I didn't leave that room the whole day and night. And I, this was, there was a purpose behind that, and this was the purpose. I said, and when I was ready to go to bed, I said, Lord, if I've sinned today, Lord. And he said, what do you mean, if? I'm in the room, fasting, praying, in the Word, getting the whole of God, getting shouted by God, getting the message of God. What do you mean, if? I got it, Lord. I got it. No matter who you are, who, we're, we're, we are sinners, man. But you see, you and I got to understand that we kind of look at sin in a different view that God views it. You know, we categorize sin. You know, and there are some sins that are bad, you know, and there are some sins that are wicked. You know, and, and uh, they need to be dealt with. But even when it's small, they need to be dealt with. I think that's where we make our mistake. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins. It's like taking a shower. How I many you know, of you wouldn't take a shower? And, you know, you work for a whole week out in the sun and you wouldn't take a shower. How I many you know, you wouldn't, <coughs> no one would want to be around you. Yeah. Right? Well, same thing w- with our sin. You, it's a daily thing. It's like bathing. It's like showering in the spiritual realm. Okay? There's a difference. There's spiritual realm. So let's look at productive failure. Productive failure, it reveals your limitations again, your weaknesses. But listen to this. It highlights your wrong thinking. How many of you know before you do something wrong, it all starts in your thinking? You have, a, you have the capacity to say, wait a minute, that is wrong. i got to change that. But if you don't change that, that wrong thinking can take your place you don't want to go. Stay longer than you want to stay. Do things you don't want to do. And then, but when it's processed correctly, it leads to a better option and keeps you depending on the Lord. That's a big difference. That's what it's all about. Is that now you can get a hold of yourself, get a hold of your wrong, say, wait a minute, this is wrong. I'm changing gears and I'm going to go this way, the narrow way where God has called me to go. That is called productive failure. Now, in saying that, let me give you a quick example. Here we got Peter. Poor Peter got it this week. If you're here all week, we seem like we hit on Peter, but that's okay. Unlike Judas, Peter had a better ending. He remembered the rooster. He remembered when the Lord spoke to him and said, Peter, get behind me, Satan. Man, the rooster's going to crow three times. And man, all of a sudden, three times he denied the Lord, didn't he? No, I don't know who he is. Ain't you the one that were with him? No, that wasn't me. No, that wasn't me. Three times. But then he heard the rooster. What did he do? He got down and he began to weep and weep and weep. And when he got up, he was not the same man ever again. He was a brand new man in Christ. See, that is productive failure. He got up, wrote the book of 1 Peter, 2 Peter. God done something powerful in his life. So this morning, can I tell you, you know, that you don't have to feel like a failure in your heart no matter where you fail, what you've done, where you've been. You've got to get it right before God. Let God shower you with His love. Let Him shower you with His blessing. And let Him rise you up, make you something powerful. Because how many know God's not done with you? We were talking about retirement back there. We're not going to retire. We may slow down, but we ain't going to retire. Amen. We may slow down, and our, and our young adults may pick it up a little bit, but we're not going to retire until I can't preach no more. Then that's, that's the end. Until they tell me, you're done. Okay, I'm done. Productive. Productive. You see, it's important we understand that because Peter understood that. He got it right. And it's important you and I get it right. Because that's what it's all about, getting it right. Why? Because God sees you and I every moment and your decisions that you make. And I don't know about you, but I want my failures in any way they come to be productive, stepping stones, to be a better man of God, to be a better spouse, to be a better father, to be a better pastor. Why? Because that's what God intends us all to be. So this morning... Think about that for a moment. He needs you and I and everything that we do. So let's look at a couple of things that will help us this morning. Because how many of you know God's not done with you, right? Say, God's not done with me. He's not done with you. No retirement. So let's be effective. Okay, first thing I want you to look with me here real quickly is if you fail to let God 
initiate your plans, you will fail. We have to allow God to get involved in every part of our life, at work, in school, in university, wherever you may be, in church. God has to get involved in our lives, in our marriages. He has to get involved. Because we don't have all the answers, but he does. And so we have to have him get involved. He needs to get involved in all our plans. Now, there's a story you find in the book of Acts. You can write this down in chapter 5. Powerful story. You know, the book of Acts, it's all powerful. But there was movement, salvation. There was healings. There was deliverance. Uh, I mean, silver and gold, I have not such rise and be healed. Miracles galore over and over in the book of Acts. There came a time where the religious folks got upset. They told them, bring them in. We don't want you to use that name, Jesus, no more. Stop using They began to threaten them. They tried everything. Finally, a man by the name of uh, Gimali who said these words, he says, you know, there was a man named Pedias, and this man had 400 men. And he was on to make a movement, and all of a sudden, uh, uh, he died, and everything just ceased. Nothing happened. He goes, now these men that you're, that you're trying to throw in jail and come against, and you see all that's happening, he goes, you got to watch out. He goes, because you're going to find yourself not only fighting them, but fighting God. How I many know when God has a plan, you're not going to stop it? God's going to move when you initiate God's plan and your plan and they, and they collide together. Something's going to happen. And so all of a sudden they understood that they could do nothing. Because God was at work. And even though he was a doctor of the law, he said, by the way, it looks like it is God. So you're going to find yourself fighting God. How many of you know that's the last thing you and I want to do is fight God? Right? Why not surrender? Yield to the Spirit. In the book of Psalms 89 and verse 33, (coughs) excuse me, the Bible says, Nevertheless, I will not break my loving kindness from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. Oh, I like that scripture again. Here we go. God's faithfulness will never fail you. Man, I can tell you stories. And I can't because I'll get deviated from my sermon. Man, stories where God always comes through. I don't care if I was in Modesto, Peterborough, Manchester, anywhere I've been in a moment, Stockton, God is too much. But we'll never experience God's great move if we don't step out and let him do what he wants to do. We limit God many times. We don't want to do that. So remember, we fail God when we don't initiate him in our plans. We will fail. God can't fail. We will fail. We work together. Good things are going to happen. Secondly, real quickly, if you fail to do what you know is right, you are sinning against the Lord himself. Doesn't James say in chapter 4? He says these words. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth not, it is sin. How many of you know, there's, that's one verse there that we many times is overlooked. We know when we do something wrong, it's sin. And he also tells us to do something right and we don't do it, it is sin. Wow. So for you and I not to give, it is sin. Because you know it's the right to give your tithes or offering. You know it's the right thing to love. You know it's the right thing to work, to work together. And not to do it, it is sin. You know, the Bible says that not to associate with those, amen, that come against God's body. Mark them. You know, and to, for us to associate with people that are barking against your church, your pastors, it is sin. Oh, but that's my friend. No, no, it's a separation. Do you know how many times I've separated myself from a lot of people that at one time were my friends? That we fought together, lived together, prayed together, cried together, and then they, fought, they go the wrong way and they, they rebel? You've got to give them to the Lord and leave them alone. But to associate with the wrong people, it's going to contaminate you. Do you understand that? You will get contaminated. And it's a spiritual principle that you don't catch until after the damage is done. You ever been around somebody that's coughing and sick? And, uh, keep away from me, you know? But when we a fellowship and associate with people that bark and bite your church and your people, you know, you don't want to be around those folks. If something's, you're being contaminated and don't know it. I didn't see nothing wrong, did I? Now, maybe it just happens in Modesto, but I'll tell you, you have to work with things because people do 
and can turn on you. And if they do, your best bet is to leave them alone, pray for them, and move on. That's good preaching. Somebody say amen. Amen. (laughs) Okay. One of the most overlooked scriptures is right there. Because God's always speaking to us, man. Always. He'll speak to you when you're awake. He'll speak to you when you're asleep. He'll speak to you when you're worshiping. He'll speak to you in the shower, in the car. He's always speaking. He'll use a donkey. You know, think about it. God did not only only use a donkey. He used a donkey to speak to a prophet. Woo, mercy. Oh, my God, speak to me. Please don't use a donkey, Lord. He used a rooster, as we just read. He used a big fish. God will use what he has to use, but he's always speaking to us. He's a good God. Can we listen to him this morning so you and I can get on that, man, on that high of the Holy Ghost? We can't even get high on the Holy Ghost because we're getting high on the wrong stuff. I don't know about you. When I first got saved, people would tell me, man, you don't drink, you don't smoke no more. How do you have fun? What do you mean? You don't get high? I'm high all the time. I, I just found the real stuff. That's all. And can I tell you something? Because I was, you know, one of them people that were always in that department high 40 years ago, thank God. Is that when I got saved and lived, just lived clean, that's a natural high. We don't even know. And so I learned to get high on the Holy Ghost. Man, and it's good. But you're never going to get high and thrill and feel with the power of God from Mount High unless you respond to His Holy Word. Because there's going to be things you're not going to want to do. I'm not going to go over there and tell Him I'm wrong. I'm not going to go over there and say this or that. I'm not going to talk to my pastor because, uh, you know what, he, he understands. No, he doesn't. You need to go fix it. You need to fix it. You know, I've called Pastor Richard. Told him, I want to apologize, you know, uh, for nothing big. Nothing big. But if you let them get big, they'll get bigger. <laughs> but when you're dealing with a small, it's easy. Same thing with your spouse. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. You know what? I want to be a better husband. Help me. What can I do to be a better man of God, a better husband, a better father? Help me. You ever speak to your spouse like that? I hope so. In Spanish, ayúdame, Señor. That means, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. We need help. Okay, number three. It takes me right into my third point. I only got a couple points left and we're done because we're going to believe God for the Holy Ghost to shake us up a little bit. How many want to be shaked up a little bit here? Anybody? How many want to be free? How many don't want to pretend no more? I don't think we got any pretenders, but just in case. Thirdly, if you fail to forgive through, notice how I bring this out, through the grace of God, a root of bitterness will grow. See, you can't even forgive on your own. You, you and I need the grace of God to be able to tap into, to say to someone, a brother, a sister, your spouse, your, your, your children, your children, forgive me. Your spouse, forgive me. A brother and sister that offended you in church, forgive me. Forgiveness goes a long way. Do you know that no one's closer to God than that one that's able to forgive others? Think about that for a moment. God forgave the whole world. So now when you and I can forgive one another, man, that draws you close to God. Because you're part of who he is. So it's important you understand that. Because there's so many things that we fail in and we never fix them. All of a sudden you feel like a big failure. I mean, and the devil will move in and, and condemn you. And all of a sudden you feel condemned. You're not free. God wants every one of us free here this morning, once and for all, to serve God, to worship Him in spirit and in truth, and let the Holy Ghost roll in your life. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 15, the Word of God says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God. You know, here's one scripture of many scriptures 
that speak about you can feel the grace of God. We have a grace teaching today that they use the grace of God to be able to sin, where in reality the grace of God is for you and I to become overcomers of sin. Did you get that? See, the grace of God is to make us strong to be overcomers of sin, not to use the grace of God and step on the grace of God and cause us to sin. We have a lot, back in America, we have so many teachings on that. That all the grace of God, you know, you're, you're, you're saved through grace, which is true. Not of our works, which is true. But let me tell you this. You're saved by grace through faith. Faith. Without faith, there's no grace. Because you have to have faith in that grace. So when you're saved by faith in grace, now you use that grace the way it's intended to be used. To empower me, man. To become an overcomer. Woo, God. Resurrecting power. Strength to go say, I'm sorry, forgive me. I'm human. So remember that. Because if you don't deal with that, the Bible says there, it will trouble you and therefore many will be defiled. Do you know what that means? You're contaminating your whole household when you don't go out of your way and say, forgive me, mom. Forgive me, dad. Forgive me, daughter. Forgive me, pastor. Forgive me. You know, this week I pray that when we leave, that somehow God spoke to you through my son's preaching, our preaching, that you're able to really appreciate your pastors, the leaders you have in this church, Sister Empower. You guys are so blessed. There's so much potential in this church. It, 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 there's so much talent in this church. Man, the Bible speaks about gift and gifting. There's so many gifts in this church. When you learn to operate in your gift, Man, God begins to move in your gift, anoint your gift. Things begin to happen. When you work as a team, as a body, look out. Unity brings anointing, breaks yokes. But in contrast here, if we don't forgive one another, then we're violating unity and harmony. And here, and many will be defiled. Something has to energize us. To go out of our way and humble ourselves. I think my son preached Friday, Wednesday night on that door. I like that. To enter into the door. And the entering into the door is, is to begin is humility. Because when you're, you allow humility to take place in your life, that's the beginning stages of being able to move and let the word of God, let God begin to work in you. Because it is pride that destroys us. You know, pride's mean. You're going to have a, a, a person... You know, in the White House, you can have a person uh, in the, under the bridge. And you can have big pride, little pride, it's pride. If you go down to the bridge or where they're there sleeping on the floor, whatever it may be, and you want to tell them, I want to give you $10, they get mad. Don't, I, don't, I don't take no freebies. It's pride. So pride can assault and hit anybody. Amen? So remember... Many will be defiled and get contaminated. If you don't take the initiative, the very people you want to bring salvation to are the very same people you contaminate. If you don't respond by God's grace, go out of your way and to forgive one another. Forgiveness brings revival, man. You know, what what brought revival to my life? God forgive me. Wow! I'm a new man. See? Forgiveness does miracles. So we need to learn very uh, quickly and don't ever stop doing it because in the beginning, everything's easy. Oh, but when you've been, say, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, it gets a little more difficult if you don't keep disciplining yourself in the things of God. The very thing that was easy for you to come to prayer, now it's not easy to come to prayer. Remember those days when you would run to prayer? Don't, don't talk to me, brother or sister. I got to go and get a hold of the Holy Ghost. See? Church, man, boss, I got to get off early today. I got to be in church. It was so easy. You didn't let nothing stop you. I used to go to church with my boots on, hide in the back, man, and worship God. When they wanted me to work overtime, I said, no, thank you. I got revival tonight. And then would tell me, well, there's overtime today. Do you want to work? Sure. There's nothing in church tonight. You need some help? You got me. And everywhere I worked, I was a boss. You better believe it. Yeah, when I wanted to leave, I left. Why? Because I worked like two men. I worked like three men. 
So this way, when they, they saw me and I wanted my time off, oh, go ahead, go ahead, man. I never heard a no. Why? Because you work your tail off so when God calls you to do something, you're ready to go. You're being a testimony at work. This is good stuff. Come. Maybe you're a little tired. Okay. Okay, number four. If you fail to live with your faith placed in Christ, it has to be in Christ, you, allow, you will allow Satan to damage your life. One way or another, he will bring damage to you. But when you put your whole confidence, your whole faith in Christ, so you have to understand, we have Jesus' DNA, okay? That is the blood of Jesus Christ. And that blood, oh, speaks values. Do you know that the family of God is closer than, than our own family? You know why? Because we're washed under the same blood. Christ is, you know how they say, blood is thicker than water, and I have brothers and sisters, and I love them. They love me. And I, that's great. But if they're not saved, they don't got the same DNA I got. The DNA that you got and I got is Jesus' blood that he shed on Calvary. It's called resurrecting power. That's God's DNA. It's in your life and my life. And there's no reason and no excuse why we can't be what God wants us to be. It's taking the initiative and, the, and follow the precepts of the Lord that he has for us. Now, in the book of Luke, we have that story where uh, the Bible says in chapter 22, 31, where the Lord spoke about Simon, Simon, behold, Satan, man, has desired to have you. Peter, the devil wants to have you and, and sift you as wheat. But Jesus said, oh, but I have prayed for thee that that faith faileth not. I like that. I have prayed for thee. You know, I think my son said the other day, Jesus is still praying. He's interceding at the right hand of the Father for you and I right now. He's saying, Father, Father, do you see Pastor Robert there? Anoint him, man. Give him favor. Give him revelations. Uh, you know, he's getting older. Help him, man. Move, move. Give him a word of knowledge. Give him something, my father. Please. He's interceding right now. Yes, Lord, keep it coming. Yeah. He, and he continued to say, I have prayed for thee that your faith faileth not, that when thou art converted, there it is, to strengthen your brother. Do you know, some of us have been here a long time, right? I know you have, because I've, I've been here with you. For 30 years. Now, are we strengthening our brothers? Or is it maybe because we're not being converted yet? Are we abiding or are we hiding? God help us, church. God help me. God help us. We need help. God has to get involved. Because the, the older you are in God, you better need more of God. Because this flesh dwelleth no good thing, Paul said. So we have to, get to keep this flesh some under subjection. So what I'm saying to you is we need each other. Now this week we came down to try and encourage you and bless you and help you. But we're also going to go back and encourage and bless from you. You see what I'm saying? We need each other. I was telling some of the ladies and some of the men yesterday, look at You need each other. Why? You spark each other to do what's right. You encourage each other to go to prayer, to go to outreach. You encourage each other. When they see you paying your time, i got to pay mine too. You know, you encourage each other. You get it? It's important. That, it's so important, church. You and I cannot function with a title. We have to function with or without a title. Head usher or just an usher. Hey, you're important to God. Whoever you are, you're important. If you're leading the worship team, great. But every instrument is important. So we're a body and it's important that we're under the same DNA. So we need each other to encourage each other to continually put our faith in Christ and to speak revival. Yes. Speak re revival's coming to the land of Manchester. Start speaking it. Start believing it. God, you're going to move. You're going to move. You're going to move. You see, as you speak it, you're sitting in motion. Don't say, oh, it's been like this for a while. Oh, God ain't going to move. And, oh, man. No, he's going to move. With or without us, he's going to move. I don't know about you. I want to be a part of it. Don't you want to be a part of it? God's going to move. God's going to save and God's going to change. You see, Satan always tempts. 
in order to bring out the bad in us. Oh, but God will always test to bring the good out of us. So here it is. God never tempts us. Never. He says in James, never will he test, tempt you, but he will test us. There's a difference. And the devil is always working. He'll attack you and I any way, shirt, or form. But the very first thing he's going to attack is going to be your faith. Because if he gets your faith, he gets it all. Don't let him undermine your faith in Christ. See, when you get saved and delivered, there's deliverance that takes place. Uh, I can, you can uh, bear witness to that. I can bear witness to that. But it's our disciplines that keep us free. Okay? Deliverance, salvation, man. I was by myself in my living room. The glory of God came in. I didn't even have a church. I started putting my money to pay my tithes. I didn't find a church for about two months. I had a bundle of money. So when I gave it to the pastor, he probably thought I made a lot of money. No, that was two months worth, not one week. He said, oh, man, I scored. No, no, not really. But you see, you're set free from money, from drugs, from alcohol. Man, my brother got mad at me because I poured all my, all my drugs and all my dope and all my alcohol in the trash. How come he didn't give it to me? Because you don't need it. See, you're free. You're free. You're under God's blood covenant. DNA, the blood of Jesus, sets the captives free. You're a new man in Christ. Deliverance takes place. You're whole. Man, I, got, I woke up with sore jaws because I was laughing so much. I had joy. When I got saved, you know, when my wife got saved, she got saved, baptized at the same time. She came to the door. You know, you have a, those screens in, the, in front of the house. You open, you have, she came to the front door, and the screen was locked. And I lied not. She was more brighter than that light all over. And there was no light on. It was just her lit up. I looked at her. I go, oh, my God. Like, what's this? I wasn't saved, so I didn't understand it. After I got saved, I understood. Man, she had the glory of God all over her from top to bottom, side to side. Until when I got saved, the glory, Shekinah glory came into my living room. So I was set free. I was healed from my, my migraine headaches. I was, I mean, miracles. That's deliverance, right? But let me tell you, your disciplines keep you delivered. You can't, you know, your thinking will go back if you don't keep your disciplines on track. That's what we have. Thank God for our church. Don't you thank God for our fellowship? You know why? Because we have prayer. We, you know, we, we have, once in a while, we will fast there on Fridays as a whole congregation, fasting in prayer. Thank God. Uh, you know, we go outreaching or we have drama. We're going back to Sunday Night Live back in Modesto. We just had a couple. We're going to have one next month again. Hey, they're getting good. So, we, we, you know, we're doing these other things, but as a team. But you see, our fellowship brings disciplines to us. Thank God for accountability. Anybody here? You know, I thank God. My wife knows where, everywhere I'm at. Everywhere. What I'm doing. But I want it. Why? Because I like it. It's a, I'm accountable. When you want to be free, a uh, low ranger, you're looking for trouble. Yeah. All in the wrong places. Pastor, we all need accountability. You know, if I'm not going to be in the discipleship like this week, I told Pastor Richard right away. He said, no problem. Go ahead. I'll call Pastor Richard for whatever. I'm going to be late. Accountability. You have to be accountable to your spouse, to your church. I tell the leaders, okay, I'll be gone to Norwalk. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go to Manchester. Okay, boom, 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 boom. You're accountable. You need to be accountable. It's good for you. So make sure you that are here under ministry, uh, those that are in ministry, they are accountable to the head musician. I'm not going to make it or I'm running late. Tech, especially now, technology. Okay, I'm going to bring this to a close here, okay? So remember, your disciplines keeps you delivered. It's not a one-time thing. You know, I've had over hundreds and hundreds of visitations of God in my life. That's not including just the good times. It comes through your disciplines. You get it. You you have to, you know, you have to do it. But what happens, we get sidetracked. Like Pastor Tom said, you know... Manchester United lost yesterday. One to nothing. Man, you get bummed out. Hey, it's not the end of the world. He, they're getting paid. They're making millions of dollars, you, you know. They got all they want. 
They're not even bummed out. They go, oh, man, happy. And here are the ones that are following them all mad. I go, no, 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 that's not right. We got Jesus. If you want to watch a game, it's fine. But don't let it cop an attitude on you. Don't let it start a problem with your spouse. You get all indifferent because your team lost. And, and if that happens, then turn it off. Okay, Pat, you're hitting too close to the heart. Oh. <laughs> hey, believe me, I know. I got three I battle. Football, baseball, and basketball. They wanted me to give us and, and hockey 35, 40, 50 years. No, 45 years ago. I go, I got enough problems with those three teams. I don't need no more. Don't let your hurts, because you're going to get hurt, define your faith. Don't let your hurts, you know, because we're going to go through some battles in this journey. But don't let them define your faith. Let your faith define your hurts. Bible says we're sheep and must wolves. You're going to get bit by people. That doesn't mean that, that means it should make you better, not bitter. Do you see the paradox? It's very important you understand the paradox. Very important. If you're going to write this, this for the long haul. And lastly, the Lord wants to give us victory in obscurity. How many of you know what obscurity is? You come to work, they bark at you. You come to church, you get bit. You go here and you go home all alone. And you say, man, it's not fair. You can, you can be barking and biting yourself. Or you can say, God, you need to give me victory in my obscurity when I'm all alone in my little dark place. You, and that's when it counts. But you know what's beautiful? That's where God wants to visit you. He wants to visit you more when you get hurt than when you got all the victory. He wants to be right with you. Hey, don't worry. I've been there, he'll tell you. You're going to be fine. But in our obscurity, when you're all alone, he's going to meet with you. I have a saying that I've heard many years ago. Remember when in darkness what you have remembered, what you have been taught in the light. Now you're learning some things this week. Conferences. I can go back to conferences and remember certain things that were said. A song that was sung. Touch my heart. Remember the things when you're in darkness, when you're, when you're in a place of loneliness, discouragement, when you're in a place where you can't figure it out, or where there's a little bit of confusion. Remember the things you have learned in the light. Man, the Word of God is the light. And it will always come for you and through you. Remember, there's productive in failure, and there's also destruction in failure. Let's look at God's point of view, because there's always victory, no matter what. Let's bow our heads to this afternoon. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord. If you've been blessed or challenged by today's preaching and you'd like to get in touch with us, the easiest way is via our website at www.newharvestuk.com. You can email us at info at newharvestuk.com or look us up on Facebook or Twitter. You can call us on 0161 278 6305 or you can even write to us at 194 Chapel Street, Salford, Manchester, M36BY. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome for you to join us at any of our services. However you might be feeling and whatever you might have been told, know this. God loves you and there's a place for you in his kingdom. God bless you. We're praying for you. And once again, thank you for listening.